Hi. Is this working out okay? Okay, good. Um, so I'm not going to have you stand up and jump around. Uh, you're not going to count to three. You're not going to have to do push-ups or sit-ups or crunches to start things off. Um, you can thank me later or not. I don't really care. Um, so yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Chris. Uh, I'm not used to speaking in stadiums, uh, at least to, you know, unless there's like a guitar and, and the rest. So just bear with me. Um, so yeah, I look after open source for Google as much as anyone does. Uh, so what I like to tell people is if something's wrong with open source at Google, it's probably my fault. Uh, and if it's right, well, I can tell you who did the good job somewhere else uh, in the company. Uh, I look after license compliance, uh, which is my main job. And, and the thing I actually talk the least about, because what I found is, uh, you know how this guy made everyone jump and they're excited? If I can talk about license compliance and the details of licenses, I can put you to sleep. So I don't do that. Uh, although if you're really, really into open source licenses, you're my kind of people, and we'll talk after. Um, yeah, so let's keep going on. So we, we like to say openness wins on the internet, right? Uh, and you've been hearing this at other, other presentations and the rest. Um, but I sort of want to say that it's not just that it wins, but it won, right? We have this exact perfect case uh, in, in the internet and the web where open standards and open source basically coexisted and sort of made each other happen. Uh, and, and I've started talking about this lately, and I don't know if anyone buys into it, but I do. So um, when, pe when the internet was growing and, and people were like, hey, I really want to put my crap up on the web, and I, I did view source, and it worked out really well, and, and you know, when I load it from my local machine, it looks good, so how do I get it on the web, right? So if it was uh, a company, if it was uh, somebody who had money, they would say, oh, I'm sure I can buy software to do this, right? And they would contact you know, Sun or Microsoft, and you know, maybe they would have something, maybe they wouldn't for them, uh, but it would be very expensive, it would be very kind of dumb. And, and they're like, eh, that's not going to work out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with these, these free so software people, and, and I'm going to download Apache, and I'm just going to use that. Uh, and the reason that they did that, it was actually very rarely because the software that Microsoft and Sun and the rest were giving them, and Netscape were, were offering them, was, was bad. Uh, it, it was just so hard to deal with them. You know, I don't know if you remember this, but in the mid-90s, Microsoft's answer for Internet Information Server was, OK, uh, that's cool. We can do this web thing. That's fine. Uh, we're just going to charge you for every user that will come to your site. That, that's cool, right? $99 per user, maybe? That, that's all right. No? OK, well, how about we just charge you for every user that visits at a time within some time period? But if you have a select agreement, then you can do this. And people are like, do you know what the web does? And and it was very complicated and expensive. And, and if you were super bought into what they were doing, oh, OK, I guess it makes sense. But you know, uh, meanwhile, people were like, yeah, but our stuff's not on the internet yet. So let's get it on the internet, right? So, so they said, these open source guys, they've got a handle on it. They're implementing what people are expecting from a web server. So let's just do that. And that's what they did. They did it, right? Um, and, and so the internet grew. And it was able to grow very fast, right? Because honestly, Commercial companies weren't up to the task of scaling for the internet, right? And, and they, they caught up, and they figured it out. And, and so what you have now uh, on the internet serving market is a combination of open source products competing with commercial products. So there's multiples of both, all with huge amounts of market share each, more than a third uh, going to commercial, more than a third going to individual open source projects. And, and, and they all coalesce in, in basically this competitive landscape uh, trying to serve you, really, the developer, and thus the users who would then consume websites. So where was that not happening, right? Why did this even happen? Does anyone ever think, hey, you know, the web is really exciting and great, but why did it end up happening the way it did? And if you look at like what was going on in the early 90s on desktop operating systems, it sucked. It was boring. I mean, there's some cool games coming out now and then, but honestly, it was, it was, it was dull. And if you were successful with some program, what would happen is someone would visit you and say, you know what, we really like your, your company. We really like your business. We like your software. We're going to buy it. You know? and, and you'd be like, well, I don't, well, don't want to sell to Microsoft or to the very big companies that managed to survive through this time. right? And they're like, well, you don't have to work. You know? We've got our competing one, and very few companies made it through this period. They were either bought or they were crushed. And every once in a while, you'd have an Intuit pop up that did okay. Uh, you'd have other companies like that, that that managed to survive this time. But for the most part, desktop operating systems, and remember, 
Windows at the time had about an 87% market share. Um, yeah, they were dull. They were boring. And they were terrible to develop for. I, I, how many of you, raise your hands if you had to develop for this monstrosity of Windows directly, ever. You know? So you, it's not awesome, right? It's not great. I mean, not that the web is always awesome, right? I mean, I've seen frameworks. We, I've released a lot of open source frameworks. I'm sorry. Um, but seriously, it's like developing for Windows in the early 90s sucked, right? And it was very hard to share information. You had a lot of people you know, banding about these terms, client-server computing, and they were doing all this stuff, and it was terrible, right? Um, but then the web came along, and it made everyone a publisher, made everyone a producer, and they were able to do it with free software. So it was very little cost. It would cost nothing to experiment and have fun. And so people did. And, and this is the, the genius of the internet, right? So meanwhile, desktop operating systems were what they were. You had 87% market share. It was pretty terrible. Uh, and, and we're going to come back to that, OK? So I want you to remember that story, because it's going to come up later, right? Um, but the great thing about the internet, right, all these core services, they, were, uh, they became like the server infrastructure. You have multiple competing commercial and open source browsers. You have multiple competing commercial and open source ways of presenting email. You have multiple competing, and so on and so forth, for all the, the core services on the internet, right? And this is great. You know? And when everyone is competing to basically serve you, the user, and even you, the developer, you, I mean, this is a really good place for us to be. And honestly, it keeps the, the big, nasty companies honest. And it keeps the, the Slack or open source people working, right? I mean, my friends, you know, me, right? I mean, you, you've heard us all joke about how we're very lazy. And that's why we wrote all this software, all right, so that we could stay lazy. Anyway. Um, and, and the great thing about the web on top of that was that you knew that something was a real open standard when there was a real open source project alongside it. And in fact, I would even go so far as to say that if there is no open source project implementing a standard, it is not an open standard. Right? So I, I just want you to keep that in mind. When people say to you, we have an open interface to our thing, it's like, yeah, but where's the open source side of it? Because they're probably shining you on. Or they're being a little dishonest. And, and maybe they even feel open, but maybe they're not. It's just, that's when you should watch your wallet. Um, OK, so this is the part where I say open source is pretty awesome. Um, back in 2011-ish, uh, I, I, I went to a, a friend of mine on my team, and I said, you know what we've never done? We've never actually counted all the, the code on the web. Let's do that, right? So we're at Google, so you know, we do search and crawling of the web. So uh, we said, OK, let's, let's run uh, what, what's called inside Google a doc join across the entire crawl uh, of the web, and let's find out how much open source code there is and what license it has. So we wrote a little license recognizer. It took like five seconds. And, and we, we walked across the entire internet, and we found about, at the time, about 31 million files. Uh, it's probably more like 34 million, 35 million now um, for various reasons. But uh, we figured out that basically the things we had sort of known in our gut in the community of open source nerds like me, uh, about half of it was under uh, copyleft share-like licenses. And then about a quarter of, of what remained was under the sort of slightly less share-like LGPLs. Uh, and so the, the LGPL, you might remember, and this is the part where you can go to sleep, take a nap. Uh, the LGPL is, uh, hey, here's some code. If you modify that piece of code, you should share that modification. OK, but you don't have to share everything else. The GPL, which is the top one with the 47%, uh, says, here's the code. Anything you link to it, you have to share that too, right? For some definition of link and share and all this other crap. And they all pinion on the act of me giving the code to somebody, right? Uh, me giving it to someone outside of my company, outside of my organization, whatever, right? So, but then everything else, this remainder 30 so percent, and that's actually grown in the last couple of years because like JavaScript nerds love MIT licenses. So, um, but yeah, so uh, the remaining uh, software there, yeah, this sounds kind of weird in this place, huh? Um, I'll try to talk slower and deeper. In, no, higher? Yeah, OK. Uh, anyway, so uh, the remaining software is basically under these notification licenses that say, you know what? Here's some code. I want you to use it. Just tell people that you used it. So if you go into your, your Android phone, I'm sure you're all using Android, right? And actually, you can do this on the iPhone, too. Whatevs. Um, you basically go to uh, your uh, about the phone, legal information, open source, and then you can start paging for the rest of your life. And you can see every license. And that's that notification, right? Because uh, Android, 
When we released it, of course, it was under Apache. And we use a fair number of Apache, and there's a, the GPL kernel in there, too. So you can see all those licenses and page through them. Um, it's, it's awesome, I assure you. The first time we did the G1, so my team is in charge of that screen, right? Uh, when we did the G1, we're like, you have to ship this information with the thing. And we've built the build system of Android so it can build that for you, OK? So actually, you have to work to actually not ship that well and in compliance. Um, anyway, uh, for the first G1, its memory was small enough that the addition of that file blew away the size of the image beyond the scope of the machine. So we had to write a little compressor for the text and decompressor. And it was not a great experience, but it didn't blow away the image. So that was good. And you were able to install applications um, that were not you know, a big thing full of text. Um, so another thing that we were curious about, and this was actually a long time ago, almost 10 years ago now, um, people used to say things like, uh, open source is a cargo cult. Uh, I've been called a communist, which in America is really bad. Uh, a socialist, which in America is also really bad. Uh, and a lot of my friends are socialists from Britain, so whatever. Um, uh, so, you know, what else have I been called? All kinds of things then with is anarchist, uh, capitalist, well, you know, uh, and a bunch of other things. Um, so instead of assuming I, we knew why people were doing this, we just asked them. So we identified 10,000 developers of open source projects. Uh, at the time, it was like SourceForge and stuff. And uh, you know, they had to have sh shipped software that we saw on the site. And then we asked them, we're like, OK, why did you do this crap? You know, why, why did you release this software, right? We've been all told for years, oh, software is this beautiful, magical jewel. Why would you give it away, you know? Um, and, and, and we got back these results. I don't know if I have a laser on this thing. That'd be cool if I did. Yeah, I do. So, um, so it was largely, hey, I want to be smarter. I want my job to not suck. Uh, I, I want. I, I sort of identify with the idea that computer science is a collaborative science. It's more like math, where we're standing on the shoulders of giants, and we want to sort of take part in, in this in this life, in this world of the mind. Um, uh, and, and then this one here. So this is I don't like Microsoft or, or Google, right? Um, although back then it wasn't Google. Um, so this is I don't like Microsoft. I don't like Oracle. I don't like proprietary software. And this is really great because people have been telling me for. More than, more than a decade, actually, you guys just hate X. You guys just hate Y. You are motivated by hate, you know? So, and, and it was never my thing. I really like computers, right? And so I, I was motivated because I like computers, right? Not that I hated somebody, right? Um, but this is nice, because it says that only a tenth of us hate, right, as our motivation, right? So that's, that's really cool, right? So 90% of us are, are driven by these, like, frankly, extremely laudable humanitarian and intellectual goals, which is awesome, you know? It's like these, these are the best computer scientists, you know? And, and, and we want to be part of that, right? And, and that's, that's, a, that's a really amazing driving factor. So uh, we're going to update this study sometime in the next couple of years. But uh, I'm hoping it stays relatively similar, right? And it doesn't become like 90% hate, you know? Um, Except among JavaScript people who tend to hate. You know, no, I'm kidding. They're always like, oh, I don't like Angular. I like this. I like Ruby. You know, but that's right. um, Yeah, so Google. Now, this is Google. Well, this was Google. Um, so our founders, they were walking through their lab. They needed machines to do their, their tests. And so what they did is they found machines that were not plugged in in the labs uh, in their building. And they just took them, took them down to their lab, plugged them in, installed Linux on some, uh, let the others keep on running. Uh, I think there's like a. A proper sun machine here, uh, yeah, there, and then there's like an IBM box somewhere in this milieu. Uh, and this is the last time we ran a heterogeneous network, right? Uh, and they ran the software on there for the backrub engine back then, and uh, tried to figure out if it made sense to to do this, right? And this was their research lab. And if people were upset that they took a computer out of a lab, they just gave it back. They're like, here, you can have it back. It's cool, you know. Um, but that was just how they did it back then. That building actually has since been torn down, so I mean, it was a while ago. Um, and, and as we grew, what we, what we thought was like, listen, um, we can go and spend a lot of money on fault-tolerant machines, which at the time, by the way, uh, for the cost of one uh, quad processor reliable Dell machine uh, with, with you, know, uh, uh, you know, the Adaptech uh, RAID you know, cards and all the rest, you could actually buy a rack of these monstrosities, right? So what you're looking at there is uh, every 2U, there are four machines. Uh, and, and normally, at this part of the talk, I'll say to people, what's wrong with this, right? 
Um, but the acoustics suck, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, so you're probably thinking, I know you're all thinking, Chris, the heat in this is horrible, right? I mean, what the hell? You know? and, it, and if you look back here, you can sort of see the, the fabric of fans hand-woven by our ancestors. No, seriously, it was like an entire bank of fans back there. Um, but there was a time when we ordered uh, hard drives uh, basically by the pound and at cost because they weren't really great. There were problems. Uh, and this, this negotiator we had on our team, Chris Bosch, he was brilliant. I mean, got great pricing. But every once in a while, he'd come back and say, yeah, this is great memory. You need to run it 3 megahertz slower, though. So, uh, but, it, but we would get cheaper memory that way, right? Um, but he got this load of hard drives, and, and they were awesome because they were cheap and they were big. Uh, this is just a bunch of IDE drives, right? Um, but as the heat goes up, you know, heat rises, uh, the, the hard drives on the very top of this rack would desolder and drip solder on the machines below, which is not the rainy day that we all look forward to, right? Uh, what other problems were there with this? Uh, so these, these metal plates here were a little thin, and they would bow. And as they would bow, the cork that was insulating the motherboards from the things would sometimes contact the metal. Again, bad. Um, and then these things along here, the, the, the cables, they would uh, grab a hold of cards and snap them off as you pulled out a machine to maintain them. So we stopped maintaining the machines. We're like, well, we don't want to break this. But the thing is, even with that, you know, even if a rack ended up being like half destroyed, it was still a better value, like by, by an order of magnitude than these fault tolerant machines. Because what we were doing is we were just saying, listen, we're going to build the fault tolerance into the end of the software. And, and we're just going to count on the way the network works uh, to basically keep these failure exposures to the user to a minimum. And there was a time, honestly, back in the 90s, there was a, a, a very special version of Google you'd get. It said, Google's, uh, try again. And, and, and what it meant is you hit one of the machines that was down. And it was very rare, because they would, they would, we'd rat you away from that thing as soon as possible. Um, but yeah, it was, it, was, it was an extremely rare thing. But still, Linux was there for us, right? And all this open source software was there for us. And so we kept on building machines this way. This is, this is one of my favorite pictures, because it's very ominous. You know, look at all those green lights. And this was just an early uh, test of some of our you know, racked and stacked you know, sort of uh, containers, right? Uh, and, and this is sort of where we've ended up. Um, Google has a lot of data centers. And it, it's all the same as it really was back then, except for it's better laid out and, and a little more clever. We build our own motherboards now. But you know, we still buy all the same hardware that you all are buying, just a lot more of it. You know? um, and, and it's you know, these machines. You know, we have power. We have cooling. We, we do data centers really well. So we, we've done a lot of work about uh, that we've published a lot of the details on how to make power efficient data centers, but it's all just running Linux, right? Our network switches, uh, excuse me, our network switches run Linux. Our, our our data centers basically run on Linux, and and yeah, and 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 then on top of that is a bunch of software built using open source tools, uh, you know, open source compilers, open source languages, uh, combined with a bunch of uh, libraries that have been open sourced, and then our software on top of that. So, so it's just it's it's a ton of open source. A ton of our, our original work brought together and given to you, and not given to you, but presented to you. So, um, so, so a lot of companies stop there, and they say they don't they want to tell you why. So I'm going to tell you a story about another company, right? Um, so how many of you are familiar with the French telecom giant Orange? Just raise your hand. Oh, you're French people. Good. You should have showed up late. No. Um, I gave four speeches in France yesterday, and like we started every single one of them like 15 minutes late. Just and we built in the time. It's totally cool. It's France, right? Um, it turns out my wife taught me that WTF actually means welcome to France, you know, um, which I didn't know. Now, France is great. I had a great time. I had little macarons. Um, but uh, French Telecom uh, back in, I want to say 2004, uh, 2003, 2004, they decided they wanted to ship push to talk to their users. And, you know, push to talk, you'll remember, is the thing where you go boop, boop. And you talk to your friend on a walkie-talkie on a bus that everyone can hear and, and take part in your conversation. Da -da, you know, it's really annoying. Um, but this was a feature they wanted to ship out to, to all French people. So they spent a little over a billion dollars upgrading their carrier infrastructure. It's very expensive to add this feature. And they had two phones planned as their first two phones that would support you know, annoying walkie-talkie mode. Um, the first one was a Windows mobile phone. And this is, this is not an anti-Microsoft talk. I'm not part of the 10%. But the first one was a Windows mobile phone. I think you know where this is going. 
Uh, and the second one was a Symbian phone, which I guess means they're the same company now because Microsoft just bought Nokia. But anyways, let me keep going. Um, so they were getting closer and closer to the date when they were looking to ship. They were about a month and, month and a week or so out. And they were seeing that every fifth was dying. Right? Uh, their engineers tracked down the failure to a shared object, uh, a DLL in, in Windows parlance. And, and they called up their representative. They said, hey, I got a question for you. What's that? Well, we tracked down this failure. And uh, I was wondering if you have a fix. Or can you give us the code so we can fix it? And I said, oh, oh, yeah, the, the every six call thing. Yeah, we know about that. And they're like, oh, great, awesome, cool, uh, fantastic. You know, um, uh, what can we do about that? And they're like, well, uh, we fixed it. And you can have it for the next revision of the operating system. They're like, well, that's fine. Give us a new version. We'll, we'll put that on the phone, ship it out, woohoo. You know? They're like, yeah, um, that's coming out in, in six to 18 months. And they're like, we're shipping in a month. They're, can't we just have a special version? And, and Microsoft said, no. You can't have a version. Um, you can get it when everyone gets it six months from now. And the reason for that is at the time, France Telecom was only about 4.5% of Windows Mobile's shipping revenue. And they did that math that commercial companies do. And, and it's not wrong for them to do this. Um, they said, it costs us this much to have a special version of that operating system and to support it, so we're not going to do that. Uh, it's too much money. It's too expensive. Sorry. And, and since they didn't control that software, France Telecom couldn't say, you know what, we're going to take on the responsibility of maintaining that ourselves because it wasn't their software to make that decision for. So in the meantime, that same time, Google had a problem where we wanted to basically ship a Linux that would allow user space programs to access ports under 1,000, which, as you know, is, is a privilege of root, um, as you know. And uh, so what we did is we made the change in the kernel because we had the code. And we were happy to do the testing and, and certification ourselves. And so we tested it. We deployed it to a test cluster. And then we deployed it to all the machines. It took about two weeks. Uh, we didn't have to ask an operating system vendor for permission. We didn't have to get a special cut of an operating system because we already had the code that we could do that with. We didn't have to tell uh, a vendor how much memory we had, how many CPUs we were going to run this thing on, what kind of hard drives there were. And these were very real concerns uh, with commercial software. So for instance, I was at a licensing conference it was so exciting, by the way. A bunch of lawyers talking about licensing, and I'm not even a lawyer. Uh, and I was listening to lawyers saying, yeah, we had to tell our engineers to shut off hyper-threading on all of the processors because it was increasing our, our software licensing costs by, by 2x. And so they're literally going into these incredibly advanced processors and saying, you know, it's nice you had this feature, but we're going to shut that off. And, and, and shutting off cores so that it would only run one copy of Oracle or one thread of Oracle. And it's just, I have to admit, as, as a software guy, as a software engineer who dabbles with the soldering iron from now and then, I'm just like, it's appalling to me that this happens. But it, but it certainly happens. Um, but not at Google, right? We tend to control our software. We tend to use open source software, so we're able to control our destiny. And additionally, it's worth pointing out, it turns out not every company in the world loves Google. I know. It's very surprising to you. Um, they say things to our suppliers like, you can choose between Google and us. You, know, you can choose to, to sell your things to Google, and maybe we won't work with you. Or uh, if you sell things to Google, or if you sell things for Google, we're going to increase our costs to you. So if you want to sell from us too, it'll cost a little more. Uh, this, this stuff really happens, and it's appalling. You know? um, but yeah, the, it, no one goes to the Linux kernel mailing list and says, OK, Google really likes the Linux kernel. We're going to have you not do things from now on. Because it just doesn't work that way. I mean, believe me, I, I've had flame wars on the Linux kernel mailing list, all right? Uh, it's a great place to have an argument. But that sort of thing just simply doesn't happen in open source. So th this is a really good thing. And also, a lot of Googlers actually came out of this world of open source. In any given month, about 500 Googlers are patching out into open source projects. Uh, you know, so I mean, our code is everywhere. Every single piece of consumer electronics you see in this building has some code that we've written in it. Because I mean, the, the main linker for GCC Gold came out of our team. You know, countless amounts of improvements to languages. Uh, I mean, you name it. I mean, literally, that thing blinking across there was probably built using GCC. And it's got our code in it. So, so we really like releasing software this way. We really want to see computer science advance, and that's why we do what we do. Um, yeah, this is, oh, look, we released some software. Um, you know, uh, through our projects, we've released 
This is actually a really old slide. I should really update the numbers. Um, I updated one number, but I didn't update the total number. It's really more like 60 million lines of code, and 100 million if you count the summer of code, the code that's been written by us. Um, but yeah, because I think that Android is actually larger than 30 million lines of code all by itself. And it's just one project, really. Um, yeah. So we come back to that 87% number. So if you looked in 2005, 2004 at where mobile phones were going for web access, OK? We had this concept of a smartphone. At the time, that meant RIM, Symbian, and Windows Mobile, OK? Uh, although it was called something else, uh, Windows CE back then. Uh, RIM had about 10, 12% of the market. Uh, Symbian was like, I think, 84% of the market at the time, and the rest was just a spattering of other operating systems in Windows CE. Um, so that looked a lot like the desktop market. And in fact, if you wanted to have your website in these emerging nascent web devices that people are carrying around in their pockets, you would be probably coding it in WAP. Do you remember WAP and WHTML? Because uh, that was a big battle back then. It was like you know the, the people on Star Trek with the different colored faces fighting each other. Um, and then uh, if users were going to see your website, you would have to cut a deal with a carrier, a handset manufacturer, and it did not look like the web. It looked like what they wished the web was, full of gatekeepers who, and, toll, and toll takers. Uh, and we knew that this would not work out well for us. And we knew that if we could have an internet-like thing going on around phones where you had multiple competing open source implementations and multiple competing commercial implementations of mobile operating systems, that from that we could probably get a free internet-like thing going on there. And it was sort of a limbic response. It was sort of like a gut response. Our lizard brains told us that this might work. Um, and at the same time, Andy Rubin, uh, who I'm sure you all have heard of, he's a guy in, who was in charge of Android until about six months ago, uh, he was around shopping a company. And he said, listen, uh, I worked at General Magic. I worked at Danger. Uh, I've got one more mobile phone operating system in me. And it's going to be open source, because I never, ever want to write a mobile phone operating system again. Okay. So there's that laziness. He's like, if I have to do it again, it's just going to be awful. So he, Brian Swellen, some other folks that were in this startup, Google's like, listen, we could fund you, but we'd rather just buy you, give you the people you need, and let's ship it. Uh, because this really dovetails well with our concerns about the state of the mobile web. Uh, and they're like, great. So we all got together, and uh, we shipped Android uh, about three years later. Um, what was interesting about it, though, uh, and a lot of people like totally don't get this about Android. Um, is it's largely under the Apache license. And, and why that matters, and again, I'm not going to go into the boring part of, of license compliance here. Um, the nice thing about Apache is it's not just saying, listen, here's, here's some code. Use, share, and enjoy, right? Uh, it's, it's a notification license. So all they have to do is show the notifications. And those are actually so easy to do because it's part of the build system. It's actually hard to screw that up. Uh, it uses a Linux kernel, but the rest of it's Apache. And Apache does this thing that's very different than the GPL v2 kernel. It says, listen, not only are we releasing software to you, but we're also releasing the rights to any patents, any, that Google might have that read on this code. So you know that we're not going to come to you later and say, you know, that's a real nice code kid, but you know, there's some patents you need to license from us. And unfortunately, there is a significant amount of precedence around people doing this in the GPL v2 world, uh, as well as in other parts of the, of the open source planet. Um, but we were saying we're not going to have any of that, so you know that you don't have to fear anything from Google. Even a future evil Google, a future big bad Google, you know, this has been done. So all you have to do is use this code, and then you have basically free reign for those kinds of patents. And that was really great, right? People were able to do that, and they were like, they, they felt that that was a good thing. Um, we didn't go after them. Microsoft tried to go after them on their patents, but um, we wouldn't do that. And, and the nice thing about that, is that uh, all, all that, that patent grant says is that you can use this unless you sue us. If you sue us, we get to use them in our defense. Your users are still fine. Their users are still fine. Just don't sue us. It's a nice sort of like defensive thing. And that's how we like to do it at, at Google. And we've released more, more code under the Apache license than any company in the world. So you know, I think about uh, probably about 80% of the code we've released is under Apache. What's interesting about Chromium, which I'll get to in a second, is it's under the BSD license for a very specific reason. Um, yeah, and, and you know, you know what Android is. How many of you are carrying Android phones? Oh, great, that's nice. Thanks. The rest of you are using Symbian phones. Yes. Um, 
No. I mean, Apple's fine, too. It's just different. So. Um, and, and the thing is, this is not something that we did and, and, and we were done with, right? Uh, we've done, I think, three, uh, two releases of Jelly Beans, uh, two Jelly Bean related update releases in the last three weeks alone. I mean, this is something we're very serious about doing. So, uh, yeah, so Chromium. Similarly, if you looked at the browser marketplace going back eight years, nine years, 10 years, you saw a pretty bleak picture. You said, wow, OK, so we've got Internet Explorer. We've got like five people using Safari. And at the time, it was Mozilla, and then it became Firefox. And, and we could see that Firefox was doing well. We were supporting Firefox both with uh, development resources, and we also had a rev share deal. Well, that was, that was business. But we wanted Firefox to succeed. Um, and, and Firefox got to about 17% market share. And the rest was Internet Explorer and a little bit of Safari, five people using Safari. Um, and, and actually, what's interesting about it, uh, saying that in Europe is interesting because you guys were always better about using Opera, and you were better about using Firefox than the whole rest of the world. The whole rest of the world is like, we love Internet Explorer. And you guys are like, what? And that's crazy. Um, you know, we're going to use Opera. And they're like, huh? You know? um, so it was like 4% Opera market share out here, and it was like 30% Firefox and like 10% Safari, which is cray cray. Uh, and then the rest was Internet Explorer. But still, it was not a situation where we could say there are multiple competing open source applications and, and multiple competing commercial applications serving this market. And so what you had, though, in most of the world was 80% market share for one company. And in fact, what's funny about Firefox, I don't know if you've heard this story, uh, you know, people in Microsoft would go to Steve Ballmer and they'd say, you know what? Uh, this Firefox thing is popping up. We're starting to worry about it. He's like, what market share do they have? And they're like, uh, 3%, 4%, 5%. He said, come back to me when they hit 10%. And, and you have to realize, the people who were maintaining Internet Explorer back then, it was like less than 10 people, OK? Right? C supposedly serving 80, 90% of the whole world on the Internet, right? And you wonder why Internet Explorer was such a laggard, right? Um, and then when it hit 10%, they, they raised the stakes significantly. They added 1,000 people to the team. Um, and, and they fought. They fought hard. They didn't do such a great job with HTML standards for a while. And then they, by Internet Explorer 8, they started caring about these things. And, and we'll get to the why. Um, in the meantime, we're like, OK, we're going to have to do our own browser. Because what we were doing is we were coming up with patches for things like Firefox and WebKit. And, and we were like, listen, um, the per, pro per tab isolation model you have is terrible and broken. Uh, one tab goes down, it takes them all down with it. That means, by the way, when something like that happens, your brain should be going like ding, 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 ding from a security perspective. Because that means that the reliability of your entire browser, every tab, every website you might be going to is being affected by another tab. That was bad. That was bad. It has significant implications from a security perspective. The, the isolation models in, in WebKit-based and Firefox and Internet Explorer were terrible. Uh, and they were very porous and very difficult to secure. So we knew that the right answer was to take advantage of the features of a modern CPU since 1986 uh, and isolate these processes from each other for reals. Um, these patches, though, uh, for, for Gecko and I mean, not for Gecko, for, for, for Firefox, I mean, they were non-trivial. And we were starting to go down this road, and Firefox was clearly like, listen, we have other fish to fry. We are being attacked like crazy by Microsoft. We're not going to keep market share if we do this per process stuff and, and security stuff. It's, it's stuff that users don't notice. And, and the reality is that's pretty much true. You only notice when something goes wrong, right? And by then, you're actually probably blaming the website than you are blaming the, the browser, right? So they're like, we need to fix all these other things first. And I'm not saying they were wrong to make this choice, by the way. Um, but we wanted to go another way. So we finally said, OK, we're going to have to do our own browser. And when we do it, we're going to do it in such a way that any code that we work on is going to be consumable by the other browser manufacturers. So Apache was out, because Apache's license can't be consumed uh, within uh, Mozilla. Right? So, so we picked BSD because it would work well with WebKit. It would work well with, uh, with any of the GPL browsers that were out there at the time, very few of them. And it could be consumed by commercial companies. Okay. So, we released this. And some of the code did make it into the other browsers. It, funnily enough, it made it into Safari more than almost any other. Um, and, and, and that's what we did. And, and what was nice about this is we ended up having that platonic ideal happen. Firefox continued to grow. They eventually actually came to agree with us on JavaScript speed being a very, very important. Um, 
And, and we learned a lot from each other on that with the spider monkey versus Chrome V8 sort of thing. Um, and in the end, what you have now is you have Chrome and Firefox and Internet Explorer. All of us are competing to basically do a better job with HTML5. Uh, and, and that's really a good thing because in the end, that means you're benefiting. And we're not fighting over stupid like monopoly lock-in bullshit. Excuse my language. You can edit that on the video, right? Um, my kids, you know, they make me pay a quarter every time I swear. And then my daughter will watch these videos and she'll say, Dad. And, and what's, what's funny about it is, I don't know how this happened, but my daughter actually collects the money. And I'm like, shouldn't that go like into some family pool? And, and she's like, she's 12. She's very smart. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, so, so that's why we did Chromium. And, that, and it comes really back to that, that decision in 2004. It's like, what's keeping people from getting to the web? And what's keeping... Uh, the web from getting to people. Because you know, Google's had this attitude for years where, like, listen, if the web does well, we're going to do fine, right? We're going to be able to, to persist and, and thrive as a company. So we just got to keep the web doing well. Uh, and that's why we did all the work on, on, on JavaScript. That's why we've done all the work on things like this. I mean, in case you're wondering, like, Google is actually like a very simple lizard, right? You just say, okay, what drives them? They want people on the web because they do well there. So it's very simple. I mean, people are like, what's Google's motivation? And it's like, we want you on the web. You know, it, it's very simple. Um, and, and finally, you know, we, we have WebM and, and a bunch of other projects we've done. And, and they all have sort of this, this commonality, right? So uh, WebM is our codec project. And, it, you know, again, trying to ship uh, free codecs has been a nightmare uh, for years and years and years. You know, uh, the only people who really get away with it are the French because they tend to protect themselves culturally from this kind of thing. Um, but like, uh, what we decided to do was actually release our own codec and, and release it under a patent granting version of the BSD. Basically, it's the BSD license for copyright. And then we say, oh, by the way, any patents we have reading on this, you got, don't sue us, then because we'll take them back. And we'll use them for our defense. So it turns that into sort of an Apache-like process, but it, it's wholly separate so that it stays BSD so it can be used by these other things. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and we've done it, this across a lot of other things. The only other thing I want to really point out to you before we go to questions that you might have uh, is MLab. Measurement Lab basically is a way that you can run a client on your mobile phone, uh, on your DSL at home, on your cable modem, whatever, whatever you use. Uh, and it really measures your actual connection that your network provider says they're giving you. And then it basically stores that uh, in an open database. You can have a copy of the database. It's, it's under, uh, I think, CCPD0. I mean, it's, it's super free. And it's actually bigger than this. It's almost a petabyte now. Um, uh, and and it basically, it's historic information about how the web has evolved over the last five years uh, using over 3 million clients worldwide. So uh, we use this for uh, broadband policy uh, folks so they understand really what's going on in their country uh, and why Denmark seems to beat us all. Um, and, and it's really important because we're not an ISP except for like a small town in Kansas. Uh, so we're not really incentivized to lie to you uh, with this data. And, and if you're worried about that, well, all the data is open and all the clients are open source. So you, you understand exactly where it's coming from. Um, and this is really important. And, and ISPs hate it. This isn't why you know it's a good project because they really hate it. So they've tried to push their own that are frankly not very good. Uh, and sort of take the burst numbers as being the real numbers while they're throttling BitTorrent and all the rest. So check this out if you actually care about this and, and have a role to play in broadband policy creation. Um, yeah, and there's a bunch of other things here. There's the WebRTC, which is the streaming version of WebM. Uh, it's very efficient, and that's been open sourced. Omaha is, uh, is a way of sending uh, differential updates to programs. So if you want to update your program efficiently, and use a lot less network bandwidth, you can do this. It's funny, we use this uh, on a lot of products. We use this on Chrome and, and a bunch of others. And I asked our Google Fiber people, I was like, do you use Omaha for fiber updates, for, you know, for updating the cable boxes and the fiber? They're like, no. And I was like, really? You don't? Why not? And they're like, it takes longer to, uh, to apply the delta and do the math of the delta than it does to send the entire image over the wire. And I'm like, oh, OK then because they have a lot of capacity. Um, so that was a little surprising, but neat. But yeah, Omaha is great for normal humans uh, who don't have gigabit fiber to their home. Um, you know, the VIP database is for polling location information. Before we started working on this in 2006 and 2004, it was actually very, very difficult to find out where you could just go vote on an election and who was up for election. Now we have free and, and truly free 
uh, feeds and uh, open source dumps of these elections uh, going back now uh, across many, many countries, uh, going back uh, for almost a decade now. Um, this, this information, uh, <laughs> many Bothans died to bring this information. No, um, when we first started doing uh, VIP, because uh, I used to run polling information uh, for the company, uh, it, you would have to pay 50 grand per district for this information, and then we just free it, and they would get so upset with us. But they knew that they couldn't keep people from voting, and it was the most un-American thing in the world for them to be doing this. So, so we worked with secretaries of state all over the United States. We worked with the, the British government, we worked with the Indonesian government, Japanese, I mean, you name it. I went to the Egyptian government three weeks before the revolution, and I'm like, I really just want to tell people where to vote, and they're like, yeah, that's awkward for us. And I'm like, really? I mean, you, you, don't you want people to vote? And don't you want that to be awesome and, and just out there for everybody? And they're like, we're going to talk to you later. And I'm like, really? And then revolution. And then you know what? Those guys talk to me. They're like, you, yeah, we actually want people to vote. And it's like, okay, cool. You know, and we worked with them, and they had elections, and we, and, and we worked together. It was really cool, actually. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I remember I was sitting in this ridiculous hotel, um, like, and hotels in, in, in this hotel in Egypt was like it was like a, it was like a fort, you know. It had like these walls and and all the rest. It had its own generators. It was like you know Fort Apache Egypt, you know. And um, and they're, they're just like, no, why would we ever want to share that information? I'm like, I'm I'm a little clueless. Um, yeah. So uh, you yeah, know a bunch of other things. Well, white spaces. So if we ever get to have. Uh, white space, uh, the UHF white space uh, networking in our countries. Uh, you're going to need these geographical databases that basically paint a picture of how the the signals conform to the landmass. Uh, and in the United States, we we've basically created this open source version of it, where basically anyone can stand up these these geographical databases and have them reflect the current on the ground picture of the spectra. So, you know, it's like. These are things that you know no one's going to care about for years, probably in some of the cases. But we've been proud to work on. So yeah, this is just uh, I don't know if you care about this. Um, where open source is going, how we're getting more people involved. Uh, if you have a college age student in your life, or a high school age student, we have programs whereby we introduce them to open source developers and open source projects. In the case of uh, college students, we pay them for summer work uh, if they're successful. If they fail, we don't pay them, so it's awesome. I know about 14% of them fail. It's a merit-based world, man. And, um, and for the high school program, uh, the top developers, we bring them out to Google. We give them lots of free stuff, like tablets and stuff. And, and it's nice. It's a high school thing. So uh, It's actually so hard to pay people internationally that for the high school program, we're like, we're just going to pick winners and, and have them come out. Um, so if you have people in your life who are that age, or if you yourself are, are a college student, who has wondered about open source, we can pair you up with a real person, a real mentor, and you can see what really real computer programming is like and then probably never do it again. Uh, so there you go. That's Google. And I'm happy to answer any questions you've got uh, for another uh, 15 minutes, and then I'll hang out. So yeah. If you have a question, oh. could you please raise your hand? Yeah. We have hands. What if they have no hands? It's very insensitive. <laughs> you raise your foot, yeah. Hi, Chris. Thank you for the conference. Sure. I have two questions. One of the questions is a serious one. Mm -hmm. um, Let's start with that one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you remember, maybe a couple of years ago, there was a uh, son and Google cars uh, doing pictures for the Google Maps uh, Street View. And uh -huh. here in Europe, Europe uh, Spain, UK, German, France, uh, there was a uh, lot of points because Google was publishing a uh, public information for the people uh, was a uh, data loss. And uh -huh. I, I wanted to ask uh, how Google protect our data because Google has a lot of data from us. So specifically uh, to Street View. Uh, so I'll start there, and then we can go to the, the other data. Um, so for Street View, uh, we had, we're very idealistic. We're like, well, of course people want pictures of their street. Um, and so when we first launched it, we, we didn't have face blurring, we didn't have license plate blurring, and that kind of thing. So we quickly realized, oh, some people are really upset to have their faces on the internet. Um, so we went through and algorithmically, a woman by the name of Andrea Fromm, she's a brilliant computer scientist in computer vision, she, uh, she implemented this algorithm practically overnight that basically detected faces, and it was really good at what it did. So we blurred all the faces, and in fact it was so good it blurred Jesus' face, on a bunch of uh, statues, it blurred horses, 
like like horses were getting burned. We're like, isn't that a little bit much, you know? And like statues, you know? Um, but it was really good she did it because honestly, you know, our our failing at Google is usually one of of just being a little clueless uh, about that sort of thing. So so we had to learn very fast, and we did in Germany. Uh, they, 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 it was, no, it was in Japan, they felt that our cameras were too high and it was seeing past the fences. And so we lowered the cameras. Um, in Germany, there was, a, there was another issue. And, and so we basically instituted these programs very, very quickly where people could remove stuff and that, you know, truly personal information like faces and, and license plates were taken off algorithmically. And, and that helped a lot and that, that, that dealt with a lot of problems. Is that the one you're talking about? You're talking about the Wi-Fi thing. Is the Wi-Fi thing what you were worried about? Yeah, yeah. so the Wi-Fi thing was actually, it, it, people don't believe us when we say this, but it was a mistake. We fucked up. We, we screwed up, right? And, and it wasn't intentional. What we were doing, um, you know, we were building a geographical database of Wi-Fi nodes, um, which is a way we use, uh, basically we augment GPS to have better location tracking. Uh, in doing that, what we were doing is we were just grabbing the 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 transmission from the Wi-Fi nodes. And in the process, we were collecting a larger, basically, uh, minimum transmission unit than we should have. Uh, and that was a real problem. And then when we found out about it, we're like, oh, gosh, that's not what we meant to do. Uh, we had some fines. And, 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 uh, and some European countries were like, uh, you must delete this immediately. And other European countries were saying, you cannot delete it until we tell you because we want to make sure we understand what you actually collected. And so we were in this terrible position where we wanted to do the right thing. And in some countries, the right thing was delete everything. And in other countries, it was delete nothing, even stuff outside of the country. So we're, and so the EU sort of unified model actually broke down from this perspective for us. And we finally dealt with this, finally, finally, finally. It was like almost a year ago or two years ago now, where all the data was finally removed. Because uh, we had governments in the EU, I'm not going to say which ones, who were like, we need a copy of that data because we want to look at it and learn things. And we're like, no, 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 that's not OK, because those, that country over there will kill us if we do that. And, and it got really ugly and really nasty. So um, it was very complicated for a very long time. And I'm going to tell you, honestly, it was never our intent to mine that data, especially outside of the SSID and where it was. That's all we wanted to know. Um, so that we could have better location tracking. And the thing is, we're not the only ones who have done that, right? Um, you know, there's a number of Wi-Fi location companies. Uh, you know, Apple's done this. A bunch of other people have done this. Um, so it's not that that w I don't feel personally that that is a problem, that just knowing the location of a Wi-Fi node is a problem. Um, and, and, and it turns out no one really felt that either. It was really just the extra data that was a mistake, and an honest one, and one that just took years for us to work through the courts and, and the systems. So that kind of stunk. What's your, is that your, do you have a second question you said? The hey. second question is the funny one. Um, Google's logo and Microsoft logo, at least the old logo, they serve the same uh, colors. Uh -huh. And some people ask me, why Microsoft and Google, they serve the same colors in the logo? Well, are you sure saying Microsoft changed their logo to have more colors so it looks like us? Yeah. I don't know. You know, I, I would imagine that Microsoft never thought that through. And maybe it just looked right to them because they want to be serious about the internet. They have colors like ours. Maybe it just felt good. I, I don't know. That kind of thing is just like, uh, you know, because people look at the Chrome logo and they say it looks like a Pokemon, uh, you know. So I, I don't believe that there's a limited palette of colors that one can use. Um, I, I wonder if that's true, though. I wonder if, like, people look at it and go, I think that that's Google. Uh, I mean, your mom, your grandmother? Your sister, is she colorblind or is she you know, fine-eyed? Um, yeah, I had laser surgery so I can see better now. Um, so maybe next time I look at the, the Bing logo, it'll look very googly, you know? Um, no, it's funny because there's this whole discussion of design language, which is way too highfalutin for me, uh, you know, my simple engineer ears. Um, but yeah, it, it's funny when people release a website and it looks exactly like another website or... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't even know what to say about that. So, so thank you for the funny question. Uh, other questions? Raise your, your appendage. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He assumes early days of Apple, because they had that Apple that was sliced like that. And, and were they just like calling out to the IBM slicing of the IBM logo? I, yeah, yeah. So we could talk about logos all day, yeah. Um, and then there's the Redskins logo, which is really offensive, and yeah. So uh, <laughs> I, I lived in DC for like, God, 12 years. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then we have someone down here too. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, thank you for, uh, very much for your presentation. Any time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my, my question is regarding open source. Okay. Uh, like you talk about uh, Internet Explorer and, uh, and uh, Chrome. Yeah. And, uh, and Firefox. Uh, and Opera. Fox as well. Yeah, because uh, uh, I know many of the people have misconception that because these uh, uh, browsers are open source, so the hackers are more chances to hack them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why, like, opening their bank, uh, bank website, even I use uh, Internet Explorer rather than using uh, Chrome or any other okay. open source browser. So what, you, what, what is your opinion? Is this a misconception, or how would you explain this situation? So, so I do believe it's a misconception. Um, I don't think that open source projects become popular and universal unless they're secure and that they respect that user's need. Um, because what you see in open source as a project becomes popular, um, they uh, attract attention from bad elements on the, on the web, right? Um, and so they don't get to stay popular unless they address that. So you saw this with SendMail back in the late 90s. Uh, you see this with browsers as they get a little more popular. If they don't address those problems, they, they, don't, be, they don't stay popular. They, they go away. And in fact, I'd say one of the strengths of Chrome is how secure it is and, and, and how important that's been to us. Um, and I think it's actually a net good if people are, are fighting about security uh, on the web. So that's a really good thing. Because honestly, when I look at the security companies out there, uh, you know, uh, seeing them fight over who can identify more bullshit malware that doesn't exist and trying to scare people away from real security concerns, uh, it, it's kind of a funny world right now, you know, because you have a lot of companies right now who are incentivized to make you afraid. At the meantime, people aren't doing some of the basic things I think that they could be doing to be safer. So for instance, using Internet Explorer, I would hope you're using a most recent version of it because earlier versions of it are troubling, right? Uh, similarly with Chrome, this is why we actually do the auto-updating in Chrome and why Firefox has started doing this too, is that uh, we found that users simply weren't updating very fast. And so we do it. We make it a requirement to surf. And then we have these malware detection things and all these other things that we run. Um, but yeah, um, the best browser is an up-to-date browser of the big four. Or five if you count Safari, but nobody does. Um, so yeah, um, I, I personally would encourage you to use Chrome. I think it's a better choice. Um, but yeah, just use an up-to-date version of IE. I was, uh, I was giving it. <laughs> there was a closed-door testimony in the Congress uh, uh, where I was talking uh, to people about piracy. And these people were very upset. They're like, look, look, I can find pirate stuff online using Google. And, uh, and I'm like, I got to stop you. You're using uh, a Windows, it was like a Windows 95 box practically, running some ancient version of Internet Explorer on Congress's network. And I'm like, listen, I got to stop you. You're going to a bunch of Russian and Chinese piracy sites. You're downloading things, and you're installing them. I, and I, I said to one of the congressmen who was there, I was like, I, I would ask you to tell the sergeant of arms to take that laptop and shoot it in the face. Because this thing, I mean, it's got to be just like lousy with malware, right? Um, so just keep your machines up to date is what I would say. It's the most important thing you can do. It's the most important thing you can tell your ma, your sister, your, your, your dog, your cat, your brothers, your, your dad. I mean, just keep it up to date. This is actually one of the funny things about Chrome OS, right? Um, Chrome OS, I, this is like, if, if I were to pick one machine that I trusted more than anything else, it's my Chrome OS box. It is the most secure machine I own. And so, like, second only to, my Android is probably the second most secure machine I own. I, I, I feel really itchy using regular desktop machines to visit financial sites, things where real money are, is going on. Just because I have, like, this overdeveloped paranoid organ in my head somewhere. But Chrome is the way I go. So, yeah. Chrome on Linux is a great way to stay secure, too. So, yeah. Um, so, did you? Um, you uh, so I think that will be the end of uh, Q&A Come on up. I'll, I'll hang out around here. Yeah. But thank you so much, Chris, for your fascinating sure. talk on open fascinating. source Google yeah. and more. Sure. Thank you very much. Yeah.